Hello, it's Dr. Bowers, and this is part five of the series of Palpation for Beginner videos that do not require you to have a partner. In this video, we'll be going over some basic concepts of joint range of motion. So to start out, I'd like if you've had any recent trauma or you know you have joint instability, that you would just watch the video and not participate. For everyone else, please feel free to um, move along as I instruct you and learn by doing and feeling as well as listening and watching. If at any time you experience any discomfort or pain while you are participating, please stop and do not continue participating. Uh, you should not feel pain. This is all very gentle types of just regular motions that people should do throughout the normal course of their day with adding on a little bit more pressure at some times. But if you experience discomfort, consider non-urgently contacting a healthcare provider to try to figure out why is it that these um, gentle things that we do today cause you any pain. How much pressure max might we be using? If you can think of what it feels like to lift a 20 pound puppy or a 20 pound baby and how you're not like pulverizing them, you're just lifting them up, that's about the amount of max pressure we might achieve today, all right? So we don't want to pulverize anything. Um, we just may at some point apply a little bit more force um, than no force at all. When we're looking at joint range of motion, in general, we want to be thinking about the quantity, so how much, how many degrees of motion can that joint move, but also the quality, what does it feel like, how does the joint actually move when it's moving through its range of motion. So to start out, I'd like you to just move both elbows. So we are flexing and extending our elbows. Okay. This is called active range of motion. When the muscles around the joint are actively contracting and moving the joint, that is active range of motion. Okay. Now I just want you to hold your left elbow like this, take your right hand and gently grasp your left forearm. And I want, while that left arm is relaxed, your right hand is just going to move your forearm. Notice as I move that forearm that my left elbow moves, but yet the muscles inside and around that left elbow are not moving it. This is passive range of motion of my left elbow, okay? Something external, some external force is moving it, okay? So in general, in a clinical setting, we watch um, the patient actively move the area that we are evaluating and then we'll go and we will passively check the range of motion and pay attention to the quantity and the quality. All right, so let's go back to this. All right, so about 90 degrees and what I want you to do is flex up as far as you comfortably can, okay? So we're actively moving it as far as we can in flexion and we're actively moving it as far as we can in extension. Let's flex it all the way that we can again. When you get here, as far as you can go, actively moving it, you have reached the physiologic barrier. Physiologically, this is as far as active motion within side can move it. All of this active range of motion is also called the physiologic range of motion, okay? So here I am again at that flexion physiologic barrier, as much active range of motion as I can do. Now I'm gonna take my right hand, and I'd like you guys to be following along as well. So take your right hand, place it here, and exert a force and see if you can move it anymore. I can move a little bit more, a few more degrees, maybe five degrees or something, okay? So you push, not to cause pain, but just pushing some, and when I've reached as far as I feel like I can pretty much push it, now I've reached the elastic barrier. Pay attention to how the force that you're applying to the forearm and how the body's pushing back at you. It's not like you've got two stones pushed against two stones, okay? It has a softness to it, and it feels like if you just kept applying pressure to the area that with time, it's going to move a little bit more and a little bit more because the soft tissues have this ability to stretch a little bit, creep a little bit, and so it has this elastic feel, hence elastic barrier. Okay, so I have 
my flexion elastic there. And if I went the other direction, have a little bit of an elastic barrier and extension, but you can't feel that as well. It's more pronounced with the flexion piece, okay? All right, so lower your arms down and let the blood get back in, okay? All right, so that was getting some basic concepts as far as the quantity of motion. So let's switch to the right side. Flex the elbow about 90 degrees. Take the left hand and gently grasp the forearm and passively move it just a little bit. Now I want us paying attention to the quality of the motion. So feel how it's decently easy, or should be, to just move it a few degrees flexion or extension, okay? All right, so 90 degrees again. I'm gonna flip my hand over since I know that I'm gonna be lifting into flexion. All right, so lift on up to flex. Do that a few times, paying attention to the quality of the motion. It goes from easy to resisting you. It should be a gradual building of tension that you have to apply a little bit more force with that left hand to be able to move the same distance up top towards that end range of motion versus when you start out here, it's a lot easier, okay? So this is the quality of motion and as you get better and more experienced with palpating when you feel this you'll be able to pick up on different vectors of the force pushing back at you to figure out um, what might be interfering with quality of motion if you notice something abnormal ideally you should when you get here feel that elastic barrier but if you don't there are different things, anatomical as well as functional, that could be interfering and causing a change in the quality of the motion. This will help you figure out if the quality of motion has changed because of something like edema or swelling, as can be seen in this right knee. Something like tight muscles, so here we have some hypertonic hamstring muscles that would make it so motion in one direction isn't going to be moving so well. But you can also have hypertonicity of multiple muscle groups surrounding a joint and that will change it in a different way. Torn ligaments, like in the medial side of this right knee, can also change the quality of the motion and its function. When we lose some joint space with things like arthritis, then the bones are too close to each other and we can actually, when we're trying to move that joint around, sometimes feel bone or cartilage scraping against each other. And then there are many more subtle variations in neurofascial structures that will change the quality of the motion and the function of the tissues. And we can pick up on that when our palpation skills are good. So which joints are going to be the easiest and safest for you to practice on yourself? That's going to be your fingers as well as your toes, okay? So advantages of working on your toes is that you'll have both hands, right? If I'm just moving a finger around, I only have one hand available to move whichever joint it is. When we're moving and assessing joints, the vast majority of joints, you want to stabilize the proximal bone for that joint or group of bones, and you want to move the more distal. So proximal means the one that's closer to the torso body, and distal means farther away, okay? So if we're looking at a toe, I want to hold and stabilize, say, right here for my proximal phalanx and then I want to grab a hold of my intermediate phalanx on my second toe so I'm holding still with my left hand and I'm moving with my right hand okay so if we just take joints and willy-nilly move both hands we're not taking advantage of our proprioceptors remember proprioceptors are really how we palpate motion and things in the body the most, okay, not our mechanoreceptors. Um, the other difference when you're working on yourself versus you have someone else who you're evaluating is right now practicing on yourself, you have the advantage of your proprioceptors inside within the joints and around the joint that you're moving and that's sending information to your brain. 
And then you also have the proprioceptors up here coming through the hands that are giving you information. Once you go and you're palpating someone else, you're obviously just going to get that external information um, of what the body is then allows your force into them when you're trying to move them and your brain will learn how to make sense of what is this thing beyond me that I'm moving and how does it affect my proprioceptors and how do I make sense of that. But it can still be useful for you to start out and learn some of the basics of how to move a joint and what it should feel like, that quality of the range of motion, the end range of motion. The other advantage to fingers and toes is most people have 10 of them and so quite frequently when you um, are examining one versus another you might notice some differences and that's really one of the important things as far as learning palpation is be able to appreciate differences and it's really hard if you're just feeling the same thing all the time so hopefully um, you've got a, a toe or a finger that maybe is stubbed or jammed or you use a little bit more than the other one when you're typing um, and it will help you get a sense and a feel for maybe something that feels a little bit more like a muscular restriction or just the fascia is tight um, or some other potential variance from normal.